Today we're going to explore the Wacom Intuos pen tablet, how that works for photographers. I'm going to talk about it, where it stands in the market, how you might be using one today or consider it. I'm going to talk a little bit about a slight hardware problem that I found with the design of the current Intuos pen tablet. And I'm also going to riff a little bit on how a tablet such as those made by Wacom plays into the photography world of the future, because I think like so many aspects of the photography industry, artificial intelligence is going to change the role of the tablet. So let's dive right in. Quick disclaimer up front, Wacom did send me the Intuos Pro tablet. This is the small size tablet, which is uh, A6 size in metric. It's about four by six inches, usable surface area. The device itself is closer to about six by nine inches as it sits on my desk because they got some stuff around it that I'll talk about. They provided it to me at no cost, no money changed hands. They didn't tell me what I needed to do with it other than to try it out and hopefully share some stuff with you. So that's what we're going to do today. So first of all, if you've used a pen tablet before, this is a pen tablet. There's not a giant surprise as to what it does or how it works. You can use it to edit on your computer as a pointing device, whether you use that with Photoshop or otherwise. We're going to take a look at how that works here in just a moment. We're going to talk about some other uses for it. So let's talk, first of all, why would I care about a pen tablet as a computing device? And so we're photographers. Let's look at this in a photography context. I'm going to switch it here. We're going to take a look at my screen. All right. So you've got Photoshop up, got a capture from when I reviewed the cheapest digital camera on Amazon. I'll, I'll drop a link down below if you want to check that out. But here we are in Photoshop. All right. So let's switch over to a picture in picture view so you can see both the tablet and my screen with Photoshop up. If you've ever used a tablet before, essentially the way that it works is the tablet surface area maps to the screen. And so, you know, if I'm in the lower left corner of the tablet, I my cursor is in the lower left part of my screen. If I move to the upper right, I'm in the upper right part of my screen. And you can customize this mapping if you wanted the tablet to only map to part of your screen, or if you have a multi-monitor display and you only want it on one screen, that's, that's actually the configuration I have set up here is that I have two monitors. You're only seeing one of them, but I have the tablet mapped one-to-one -one with that monitor surface area. We are here in Photoshop, and the biggest thing that you will see a tablet used for is for photo retouching. And with that retouching, the big advantage of a tablet over something like a mouse or a trackpad as a pointing device, I think there's really two big advantages. One is the precision. Much like when you write with a pencil, when I'm using the pen tablet, I have very fine control. I can, you know, be, if I wanted to, for example, you know, paint my fingernail here, I have much greater control with that pen tablet than I do with just a mouse. The other thing that the pen tablet gives me, in addition to precision, is that it gives me the ability to control the pressure. And I've got the brush tool selected right now. So if I'm gonna give it a big brush, right? So if you're seeing my screen, you see I've got that big brush size selected. But if I start drawing with it or writing with it, you'll see as I alter the pressure on the pen, much firmer pressure, and then I lighten the pressure up and it starts to fade out, I get a much thinner brush stroke. What's happening is I'm using pressure sensitivity with the pen to control the flow in this case with the brush tool that I have in Photoshop. That's cool. Makes sense when you're brushing that, you know, much like if you're using a marker or a, a paintbrush, you know, light pressure is going to give me just a little bit of a mark, whereas heavier pressure is going to really fill up that brush size. The pressure sensitivity is one thing. As photographers, we don't brush and paint and draw that often unless we're creating like a painterly effect on a fine art piece. I'm going to go ahead, revert this back to the open image, get rid of all those drawings. But if we consider how we often use the brush tool in Photoshop, what you might find is that there's a lot of other purposes where this can come into play. And so I'm going to go ahead and grab the object selection tool here in Photoshop tell it to do a selection of my subject. Let's use that selection 
And I'm going to come over here and let's create a hue saturation adjustment layer from that. So you'll see that it's created an adjustment layer over on the right hand side. But then once we have that adjustment layer, um, if I go back to my brush tool, as we know, when we edit on a layer, black conceals, white reveals, and so I can then use the brush tool with that pressure sensitivity to adjust my adjustment layer. And so if we want to see what that does, let's let's super saturate me. So I am crazy neon man here. That's not a good look. Love those green eyes. But if we've got that super saturation and then I want to adjust that brush, maybe I've decided that I want to be crazy neon man, but I don't want this digital camera here to be quite that way. And so uh, I can use my black brush and I can start painting on here. And with that pressure sensitivity, I can paint big broad strokes or I can paint smaller strokes. Now I'm realizing as I do this, this would be another example where I could have used AI object selection to select this here, but I didn't because I'm demonstrating the brush technique. And so what you get with this pressure sensitivity is not just the ability to like brush and draw on with paint strokes, but you get the ability to use pressure sensitivity for your masking. How much time have you spent making refinements to adjustment masks, layer masks in Adobe Photoshop? It's quite a bit. All right, let's go ahead and revert this back to our original image as well. It gives you that precision. It gives you that pressure. You can use that for painting. You can use that for masking. One of the other kind of cool things that I wanted to show. So I've got the brush tool selected again. I've added another layer here. I'm just going to demonstrate brushing on a bunch of paint. Cool. Made a bunch of paint. Fantastic. Now, what do you do when you have a pencil and you want to erase things? You flip the pencil over to the other end. So the Wacom pen showing you here in the view, in the picture in picture, has an eraser in. So if I flip that over, it automatically is gonna to switch to the eraser tool in Photoshop. It has that smart capability. These are all settings that are customizable and controllable through uh, the Wacom Pen tablet control panel. The other thing that the pen has, and if I switch out of the picture in picture and I just go back to showing you me, I want to show you, so if you look at the Wacom pen, I showed you how the tip can draw, the eraser can erase. There's also a rocker switch right along the side, so you can customize either side of that rocker button to give it a custom action. Uh, for example, I often will set uh, one end of the rocker button in Photoshop, and because you can set this per application or system-wide, but I'll set that one end of the rocker button to the option key, which you know, helps you select a source when you're using the healing brush or the clone tool or things like that in Photoshop. So let's switch back over to Photoshop. There we go. We are back over in Photoshop. I'm going to flip over to another photo. This time I have a portrait. Um, and on that portrait, if I wanted to do a little bit of cleanup, for example, uh, if I zoom right in here, you know, kind of right in the center of her forehead, there's this, this darker spot. Let's say I wanted to get rid of that. Um, in Photoshop, I've used the tool to map one of the selection buttons to the alt. So if I choose my healing brush tool, I tell it uh, I'm going to heal that area out. I'm going to say alt, select my source right up here. And then when I use the healing brush, it, you know, grabs from that area. Uh, same kind of thing with, you know, other types of things. If I remember right, down on her shirt here somewhere. Down on her shirt, I've got this little white spot. I'm going to go and switch over to the clone tool. And again, just press the button on my pen, sample my area, clone that out. I've chosen to use one of the other side switches to zoom to fit to screen. So just by tapping a button on my pen, I zoom back to fit to screen. So if you set those custom mappings in your tool, let me switch back here so you can see me, it really gives you a high speed way to edit your photos because you don't have to move over and use the keyboard shortcuts. You can just tap little things with your thumb on the pen button and quickly move through the different areas of Photoshop. Now, one of the other things that Wacom added to their tablets a little while back is if you look at the tablet, down one side, I've got a series of buttons 
including a little uh, wheel right here in the middle. And these are all entirely customizable through the software interface. You can choose uh, global system-wide settings. Uh, you know, if you want to have like system-wide hotkeys that launch applications or perform keystrokes, you can also set them on a per application basis. So these could be shortcut buttons. You could have these mean zoom in and out in Photoshop, for example. These could be custom actions that go back and forward in your web browser. It really is up to you to customize how you would want those to be based on how you use your computer. And I'm a big fan of buttons. I've got a couple of stream decks here on my desk, some of which I'm using as we record this very video. And so, make it your own. The power really is in your hands. So there's a lot to like about the Wacom tablet, and I would encourage you to check it out if you haven't tried it already. That said, it's not some sort of crazy panacea. It's not perfect. One of the things I do want to mention that was a little bit goofy is it's 2023, and here's the cable that ships with the Wacom tablet. USB-A. Again, it's 2023. Apple hasn't shipped a MacBook with a USB-A connector in how many years? Five years? Six years at least? Uh, and you might not think that's a big deal. Right now I'm connected via Bluetooth. If you look at the tablet, you'll see, you know, there's no wires attached currently. So I'm connected via Bluetooth and it's working just fine, but it uses a cable to charge. And it also has an optional cable connection. You can use that for connectivity if you don't want to use Bluetooth. One of the things I did run into with this tablet is when I plugged it in via the cable, I started having issues with the software. It was showing up, it was going away. Uh, and I went back and forth with Wacom support to try and figure out what was going on. They had me go through some troubleshooting steps with the software. We eliminated the software as a problem. And it kind of came down to there's probably a hardware issue either with the cable or the tablet and the port. And in troubleshooting that, Wacom was very adamant that I couldn't use a USB-A to USB-C adapter and get reliable results with this tablet. If you can't use an adapter to plug the tablet in, you can't use the tablet on any MacBook made in the last six years and Windows PC laptops are the same way, the higher-end ones are not shipping with USB-A ports anymore. And so for a premium hardware manufacturer, which is what Wacom really is, right? This is not a cheap bottom-of-the-line product. It really is a well-made, well-performing piece of hardware. For it to ship with a USB-A cable and for them to tell me that it can't work reliably with an adapter, really is just kind of missing the mark in 2023. And I'm optimistic that Wacom will update their cable interface to be more modern, work with current computers. And so speaking of being modern and working with current computers, let's talk about how this plays into artificial intelligence. Because if we go back to looking at why someone would use a tablet, I said there were a couple of reasons, right? Precision and pressure pressure isn't necessarily affected by artificial intelligence. But when we talk about precision, if we talk about using a tablet for things like very fine mask adjustments or very complicated or intricate selection techniques, a lot of those things are becoming less needed because we have AI tools that can make those selections automatically. I no longer need to go in and make a really detailed, complicated masking job around the weird outline of something in a lot of cases because tools like select subject in Photoshop or select object, or if we get outside the Photoshop world, let's talk about Luminar, right? I did a video not too long ago looking at Luminar AI and with the right mindset, it is very powerful. I had a conversation with uh, the education director for Skyloom, Vanelli, and one of the things he said was that they feel that if you have to use your mouse or a pen and start making really precise selections, that's the old way of editing photos, and I think he's got a point, right? A lot of cases, the artificial intelligence can figure out those selections or figure out intuitively what you're trying to do and do that automatically 
with, you know, the click of a button or the selection of a menu command without you needing to manually edit and mask as a photographer. And so we are where we are right now. There's nothing wrong with this tablet as a tablet, USB cable issues aside. That said, I think as we move forward, for a lot of the uses where photographers traditionally would use a tablet, selections, retouching, refinement, things like that, I think other technologies have picked up their game and will continue to increase in efficiency and make it less likely that you'll need a tablet for some of those purposes. Let me know what you think. I've got links to the different stuff I talked about down below, including a couple videos that I referenced. Leave me a comment. I would love to hear, have you used a Wacom tablet in the past? Are you on the fence about it? What have your experiences been? I would like to know that. And, you know, stick around, subscribe. I'll be back again with another interesting tech photo video very soon. Would love to have you here and always take care.